So in this video, I want to make sure that we know what the general procedure is to apply Newton's laws to solve problems with forces. So you're going to see this a lot because Newtonian mechanics is the heart of classical mechanics. So everything that we've done for the last couple of hundred years before relativity was basically based on uh, Newton's ideas. So Newton's first law is basically a statement. Actually, actually, let's write Newton's laws in simplified form. So Newton's laws. In simplified form, the first law basically says that if an object, if the net force acting, if there are several forces acting on an object, and if the net total forces on all an object is zero, then basically the object stays at a constant velocity. And uh, so this is just a statement of actually the second law, but this is a, just a statement of the sum of all forces acting on an object, if it's equal to zero, then the object velocity, uh, so remember, so let me uh, put it in a different way, is equal to zero, then the object stays at a constant velocity. And this is really nothing more than a special case of mass times acceleration when the acceleration is zero. So if the acceleration is zero, so we know that the acceleration is defined as V final minus V initial over time. Since this is equal to zero in multiplying t, we see that v final minus v initial is equal to zero, which means that v final is equal to v initial. And this is really a special case of the second law, because the second law basically says that the sum of all forces acting on an object will cause it to accelerate in the net, direct, net force direction. If the sum of all forces acting on an object will cause it to accelerate in a certain direction, say in the direction of the sum. And the third law says that if you have if you have an object causing an interaction with another object, if A, for example, is pushing or pulling object B, then that's called the action force. The reaction force is the negative of the force that B is acting on A. So for example, if object A is next to object B and A is pushing A, B, then the force of B reacting, the reaction force, is basically the negative of B acting on A. They're supposed to be negative. So these are three laws. So really, we should be actually saying two laws. And so these are the two laws that we'll be used, constantly using over and over again. So number one is a special case of the of the second law when the acceleration is zero. And if the acceleration is zero, we know that over some in period of time, v final minus v initial over some time is equal to the acceleration. And if you multiply t on both sides, you see v final minus v initial equals zero, or the velocity doesn't change. So really, the first law is a special case of the second law. So really, maybe we should have said uh, the two laws of Newton, but Newton's original laws were uh, three. So anyway, so let's do some examples because we're going to see this procedure over and over again. So I'm assuming that you have a basic understanding of Newton's laws. And so let's put it to our understanding of some applications. We're always going to do the following when, uh, wherever we, uh, we have a problem. So read the problem. Number one, draw a diagram. So after you read the problem, always write and or draw a diagram to represent the problem. Number two, after you draw the diagram, right, do a free body diagram. After you finish the free body diagram, then apply the second law. which basically means you're going to be writing sigma f equals m a for each of the objects. So I'll put a little symbol a to represent each of the symbol objects. So you're going to sum up all the forces and write m a. Then basically solve the equations that you get. So these are the basic four steps that you're going to be constantly doing over and over and over again. And I'll start giving some examples to make sure you understand the idea. So in the first example, let's uh, 
so example number one and let's see if I can do this properly because uh, I do have a small board uh, so if we were in lecture right we'd actually spread around like several boards but uh, so I have to be really wary about exactly my lecture space my board space so number one we're given a problem of you're given a mass M and this mass right is under free fall so you have a free fall object so you have a mass m for example on the surface of the earth i drop an object and it starts falling straight down and then i ask myself right let me analyze it using newton's laws so of course the first thing you should do is a free bot uh, we draw a little diagram and so here's my little diagram it's going down <laughs> So here's a mass, it's falling down. And I'd like to calculate what, let's first calculate the force of all the forces acting on this object. So I've done my the little diagram. So step number one, done, drawn a diagram. So number two is I'm going to do a free body diagram. So this is step number two. And I don't think I'll keep writing free body diagram, so I'll just say FBD for short. So here's my free body diagram. So this point, some people like putting a little box and maybe, maybe I'll let me do a little circle. So here's my little circle that represents mass number one. So if there's several masses, you'll do several free body diagrams. So here's mass number one. And if it's dropping, right, the only forces, right, at the surface of the earth, if I neglect air resistance and other forces that are not pertinent. So the main force, right, is the force of gravity. I'll label this as going down. Force of gravity. So this is our free body diagram. In our free body diagram, right, it might be a good idea also to actually have a general direction of i, j, and k. So whenever you see these problems, right, eventually going to make directional units. And I'll always try to make the direction, right, say, I say this is I unit vector is always to the right and J. So in prior videos, I might have said that I is going to be east and J is north. But here I'm going to say I is right and J is up. So now I have a general sense of direction of what these vectors are going to be. All I know is that this force of gravity, I, I, let's calculate the force of gravity in this problem. So I've done my free body diagram. And so step number three is basically right write the equations for uh, using Newton's laws. So here is step number three. So basically we write always sigma f and I'll put it in the other way around so you can actually see it a little bit better. Mass times acceleration is equal to sigma f. This is the second law of Newton. So now all I know right is that some of all forces happens to be the force of gravity. The object is in free fall. So there's only one vector force of gravity. But I know one thing, I can apply an idea from Galileo when Galileo was dropping, well supposedly dropping objects off the um, uh, Leaning Tower of Pisa. He noticed that all objects, right, I'll, of relatively the same, of exactly different masses, mass 1 and mass 2, and with neglecting air resistance, they would fall at the same rate. Now we know what the rate is on the surface of the earth. We know we, we denote the symbol G to represent that on roughly on the surface of the earth that objects accelerate to the earth's surface at a rate of 9.8 meters per second squared. It's a uniform acceleration that all objects feel. So neglecting air, air and air resistance. So all I know is that this acceleration A, right, is down. And if I know it's down, I can write this and say this is really mass times acceleration. And since I selected J to be up, right, so this would be minus J. And the acceleration, I'm sorry, is G. So I might as well not so here is a minus j vector are going down. And so we can write this and make a summary statement of saying that the force of gravity 
is equal to something unusual, mass times g, j. Or if you want just the magnitude, you can just say the force of gravity pulls an object down by mg. And that's kind of interesting. So let's uh, let's do another problem. So basically, I've solved the problem. So actually, this is I guess we have written this down in a free body diagram. We have used second law to write this equation, and this is actually step number four. I can now go through it and solve for things. And so for I can now say the force of gravity on an object of mass m is always mg, where g is the acceleration due to the object when you let it go. So let me do another problem and we'll repeat this procedure over and over again until you feel comfortable doing this or I get tired from doing this video. So here's another example. Find the normal force pushing an object of mass, mass M on a floor. And actually, hopefully uh, you can understand it, but let me draw a diagram for this. So this is really step number one. So what I have is a mass on the floor and there is a normal force pushing me up that's holding me back because gravity is pulling me down. And uh, this normal force, right? Actually, let me do a free body diagram right away. So this is actually the diagram that I can draw. There's a mass, it's on the floor. Step number one. Step number two is a free body diagram. So we'll put a little circle, dot, square, and then look at all the forces. So there's a force of gravity acting down. Is that the only force? Well, if that was the only force acting on that object, this object would be, this mass would be accelerating towards the center of the Earth, towards the center of the Earth. But it's not. It's not accelerating. So there must be something else acting on this object that's causing it to balance out. And that's called the normal force. This normal force is usually donated by the symbol N and it's perpendicular to any surface. So if you're wondering, N usually means normal, the normal force, the force perpendicular to the surface, normal to the surface. So here's our free body diagram. I'll label it as FPD, the free body diagram. Next, um, step number three is to look at the free body diagram. And uh, just to make sure our free body diagram, we should always have units of directions. And I'll always select I to the right and J up. So there's nothing to the right, but I'll always do this anyway. So this is my coordinate system. So you know the directional vectors. So I'll now write our summation in terms of um, Newton's law, second law. And so this is, says that sigma F is equal to mass times acceleration. So what is sigma f? What is the sum of all forces? Well, there's two forces, n vector plus the force of gravity pulling down. And that's equal to mass times acceleration. But this object is stationary. It's not moving. So the acceleration is 0. So we can solve for n. n is on the other side, so n vector. So I'm solving in step number 4. The normal force, right, is negative of the force of gravity. But stop. What is the force of gravity acting on a mass? We actually proved it earlier. So remember, Galileo dropped objects. Acceleration was constant. He found that all objects accelerated the surface of the Earth at the same rate of 9.8 meters per second. And once we did that, we found the force of gravity acting on an object, right, is mg mass times the acceleration at that point. For us, if this is on the surface of the Earth, right, then this must be nothing more than minus mg, but force of gravity is down, which is minus j. So remember, the magnitude of the force of gravity is mass times gravitational acceleration. And remember, g is just an abbreviation for a constant. 
you don't want to write numbers in any of these equations because you want to correct your mistakes. If you write long numbers like 9.8 meters per second everywhere, you have to carry that luggage with you in all of these expressions, which is time consuming. You don't want to do that. Instead, what you want to do is basically write symbols so you get better at symbols and uh, write an answer like this is equal to mass times g up. So notice this is saying that the normal force that's pushing this object up, it's pushing up on the diagram. So this is really the normal force acting up. So if I put the free body directly on the uh, diagram itself, gravity is pulling down, normal force is acting up. I can say this because J means up, mass times gravity. If somebody does give you numbers, they, they say that the mass happens to be 10 kilograms, then I can tell you, and the last step, right, bring out your calculator and just say this is now 10 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared J, and that is 98 newtons J up. So remember, always bring out the calculator in the last step. You're going to see this over and over again. Whenever you do physics, right, we never use constants. Like if somebody says pi, nobody they use the symbol pi, not 3.1415 and so on. Nobody wants to put uh, exact symbols in because it's very time consuming to make little mistakes in numbers and, but symbols are very easy to understand. So here's uh, one example. Let's do another example, a little more complicated. So imagine the following scenario, right? We have a, uh, a flywheel. Here's the flywheel. And over one flywheel, we have a thin string attached to mass M1. And on the other side of the flywheel, we have an, another mass M2. So actually, this is actually, um, usually this is a word problem, but uh, this word problem I'm converting into a diagram. So I'm actually doing step number one, which is draw the diagram but I'm explaining it in terms of drawing the diagram. So always draw diagrams, but uh, I'm doing a diagram to explain the problem. So you have mass M1, you have mass M2, and when I let it go, one mass is heavier than the other and tends to accelerate. I don't know which one it is, but it's M1 and M2. So I would like to know number one. I'd like to know the acceleration of this M1. So for example, let's call uh, this acceleration is A, so let's assume M2 is heavier, so it's going up. It doesn't have to be, but we'll just later, right, A could be negative, but uh, assume that M1 is accelerating up and M2 is accelerating down. And we also would like to know the tension in the rope, so the tension, T. So T is the tension in the rope. A is the acceleration, and quite arbitrarily, I'm just going to select this to be up. So step number one, we drew a diagram. We have a rough idea. We have a frictionless flywheel, so we're not worried about friction. The flywheel, and we're not even worried about things later we might mention called moments of inertia. So the flywheel has no moment of inertia to really worry about. It's just we have a system where there's no friction and this mass, thin ribbon, and our thin string M1 is being pulled by M2 and we let it go and this goes up and this goes down. So our two variables we don't know. We don't know what tension is, we don't know the acceleration. So our first step, right, is we'll do a free body diagram for object number one. So here's our free body diagrams. So our free body diagram basically says that look at M1. So here's the circle for M1. Actually, well, let's put M1 here just to make sure it's a little circle. And we know that there's a tension force, T, and I'll label this as tension force. There's a tension force pulling up. We also know mass M1 feels gravity, so there's a force of gravity, and I'll label this as 1, down. I'll also write the free body diagram for mass number 2. 
So mass number two, there's a tension force T2 pulling up, and there's a force of gravity pulling down. So there doesn't seem to be any other forces, so we seem to have, again, we are two unknowns. We'd like to know what the tension in the rope is, what the acceleration is. So we have T1, FG1, and T2 pulling up, and FG2, force of gravity pulling down. And that's all we're given. So our free body diagrams are set. But before we do, we'll always try to make directions. So I'll always say everything to the right is I, and up is my directional derivative of J. So to the right is I, J is up. Okay, great. So let's see if I can split this board slightly right over here and split it back over there. So look at free body diagram number one. Now a couple of things. The magnitude of the tension T1 is equal to T2. So the pull on the string pulling upright has the same tension uniformly through the string. The tension does not change on this, this, this rope. All I know is that the magnitude, notice the arrow, there's no arrows in here, just the magnitude. We'll just call this symbol T. So let's go to sigma F for, so our step number three is to now do a sigma F calculation for free body diagram number one. So we know that the sum of all forces acting on the mass number one is mass number one times the acceleration of one vectors. So this is for mass number one, here it is. So let's, let's fill in the details. A is going up, so F1 is equal to the tension in rope, T1, up, plus the force of gravity down is equal to mass times 1 times the acceleration vector. Now we start breaking apart into components. Here's T1. T1 is the tension up. So T1 is going up, so we know it's Tj. Up is Tj. So I'll write this as Tj. What's the force of gravity? Force of gravity is mg. We know it's supposed to be the mass times the gravity, gravitational acceleration. So we'll refer to this as mg minus j. Actually, let me make things a little bit bigger. Sorry. Tj minus plus mg down, which is minus j hat, and is equal to mass times 1. What's the direction of the acceleration? Well, a seems to be going up, so this would be aj. So here's our first equation, and if you want to pull everything out, you can actually see that uh, this is t minus mg acting on j vector is equal to m1a j vector. So how can these two vectors be the same? Well, their magnitudes must be the same because if they're the same value, so that must mean that we have a first equation that says t1 minus mg is equal to this is m1 times acceleration. So remember, and this is supposed to be t, I'm sorry, t. So we, we don't know t, we don't know a, we know m1, we know M1g. So maybe I should give you some numbers on this. So let's just say that M1 is equal to 10 kilograms and M2 is equal to 20 kilograms. So we have equation number one. So this is sigma f for taking our free body diagram, writing the equation. Now we repeat the process for the second equation. Again, we're going to write this as sigma f 2 is equal to mass of the second object times the acceleration of the second object, and this is A2. Now we know that there's a tension up T2, so this is really T2 vector plus the force of gravity on the second object is equal to the mass of the second object times the acceleration of the object. Now we start breaking apart into components. What is the tension T2? It's going up, so it must be Tj. The tension of pulling up and the tension pulling up this way, right? The magnitude of T is exactly the same. Rope doesn't actually uh, change tension anywhere in the, along the rope. So next we have force of gravity. Force of gravity is down. So that's actually just mg minus j of the second object. And what's the acceleration? m2. But what's the acceleration? Acceleration is down, but it's going down at A. So this is minus AJ. So we can rearrange this and get, so this is really T minus M2G 
acting on j hat is equal to minus m2aj. How can these two vectors be the same? Well, they're the same if the magnitude or this coefficient of the vector, right, the scalar element here is equal to this. So that means that t minus m2g is equal to minus m2a. So here we have, we have two equations and two unknowns. So if you can remember a little bit of uh, basic algebra, you know, if you have two equations and two distinct equations and two unknowns, we should be able to solve for each of the unknowns. So we have the equation number one. So I'll write the equations down. And the second equation is t minus m2g equals minus m2a. So this, this process now is very mechanical. You have to repeat this over and over and over again, right, in uh, your physics classes. So I'm going to solve for t in the first equation. And so we'll get that t. So I'll put a little arrow here. t is equal to m1a plus m1g. The second equation, I'll solve for t again. t is equal to minus m2a plus m2g. Next, I'll equate these two equations together so we can get eliminate t. So we can write this as m1a plus m1g is equal to minus m2a plus m2g. Move everything to one side and you're left with m1 plus m2a. So I'll move this term to here. Then I'm going to move this term to the other side, which is m2. Actually, I'm skipping steps, so you, hopefully you can see this. So I move this term into here, factor out the g. So, and then I solve for a. So what is the acceleration? Acceleration is the difference m2 minus m1 over m1 plus m2 and g. So I have just solved for the acceleration. But now we can substitute this back in and the tension therefore take one of these equations. I'll take the first one and substitute back in. So this is now m1 times acceleration, but acceleration is really m2 minus m1 over m1 plus m2 g, that's the acceleration, and then add m1g. I want, I don't want you to waste time thinking that um, this is all algebra, right? And well, it is algebra, but I don't want you to waste time actually reducing these equations to a simpler form. This is basically, you have an answer for tension and you have an answer for the acceleration. In your last step, and uh, let me erase this portion right here and we'll go through the last step. That's your calculator. And so you plug in these numbers on paper and say that acceleration from the first equation is equal to m2, m2 is 20. So if I'm using standard units, which is kilograms, meters, and second, I'm not going to put the units down because it's time consuming. I'll say 20 minus 10 kilograms. XLG is now 10 plus 20 multiplied by 9.8. And the whole answer is in meters per second squared. So bring out your calculator and calculate it. We can repeat the process again for the second equation, which is m1 is 10. I'm not even going to try to reduce this. It's only a couple of steps to reduce, but it's not important. Don't try to reduce things. Uh, you, well, if, you, if it happens to be easy, go ahead. I'm, I'm not going to. It's time consuming. And I just want to write down answers. So here's 20 minus 10 all over 10 plus 20 times 9.8 plus m1. m1 happens to be um, 10 times 9.8. And the whole answer is in units of Newtons. So bring out your calculator, plug in the answer, and uh, write this as the correct answer for acceleration and tension. So you have the same basic procedure over and over again. So let's do another example just to get the idea of repeating this over and over again of drawing a diagram, do a free body diagram, 
write your sigma f's, convert those into equations, solve the equations. So these are the same steps over and over and over again in all of your um, calculations for using Newton's laws. And you're going to repeat this over and over again for many... Uh, anyway, so the basic procedure is exactly the same over and over again. But you'll have to repeat this over and over again. So, so let me erase this. So let's just keep uh, expanding this. So let's imagine that we have a frictionless surface. And actually, so we have a mass M1. And it's connected to a pulley. And this pulley is basically massless, so we don't have to worry about it. And it's connected to another mass, M2. And so the surface I'm going to assume is like ice and M1 just slides across. And the question is that as this thing is let go, this object, right, will start accelerating down at a certain A. And this goes across with certain A. It's accelerating down. And there's a tension in the rope. So the question is, how do I solve for A and T? Find acceleration. And step number one, we had to draw a diagram. In fact, I'm drawing the diagram to actually explain the problem. But uh, if it is a word problem, always draw a diagram to make sure you understand the problem. So our, so our first step is already done for us. Our second step is we'll have to do a free body diagram. So let's do it for mass number M1. M1, right? And usually, I'll, I'll put a little square for M1, OK? So you get used to the idea, a little dot if you want. What force is acting on this? Well, there is a normal force because it's on a surface. There's a force of gravity pulling down. And I'll put a one there so you know that there's, there's force gravity. There's a tension in this rope, so I'll call this T, T1. Great, so here's our free body diagram for mass number M1. Free body diagram for mass number 2. Let's see if I can roughly over here. Okay, so here is mass number M2. Well, there's a tension in the rope up. Notice it's pulling up. Then there's a force of gravity pulling down. And that seems to be the only force. Notice that only M1 has a normal force, M1. And uh, but T is not touching any surface, right? So there is no normal force acting on that. So let's go through. On, when we do the free body diagram, always put your labels of directional vectors. I'll always write I and J to mean either east or to the right. And in this case, I'm going to select this to the right. And J is going to be either north or up. In this case, it's going to be up. So we write our sigma f's in first equation. First equation says that sigma f acting on the sum of all forces, so sigma is just a symbol to mean the sum of all forces acting on the first object is the mass of the object times the acceleration of the object. So what are the forces acting on that object? We have a, well, we have a couple. So we have N1, the normal force, then the tension in the rope, T1, then we have the force of gravity, pulling down. And then we have m1 times the acceleration. So now we have a vector equation. And the next step is, now that we can have i and j, we're going to break it apart to components. So the components of this equation, right, n1. n1 is, I don't know what it is, but it has a magnitude n1, and it's going up. n1 is n1 up. Notice this one is a vector. This is just a number. So this is just a scalar value. Okay, n1j. How about the tension, T1? T1 is, I don't know, but I know the tension, right? Whatever it is in the rope, right, must be T. It's exactly the same tension that experience here as opposed to this string. The string transmits a uniform tension, except the tension is going to the right, is pulling M1 to the right, while the tension in this rope is pulling M2 up. So how do I say right? T uh, to the right is I, 
And what's the force of gravity? Force of gravity is acting straight down. So this is actually minus m. I'm getting lazy, so let me just write down the answer. So it should be uh, minus j. But uh, okay, m1 g times minus j. And this is mass times acceleration. What's the acceleration? Acceleration is going to the right. So how do I say that? It is a, the magnitude of the acceleration, the amount of the acceleration. It's going to the right, which is i. So we have, uh, now we have written the equation, the components. Now we just write down and rearrange these terms. So look, I'll put the i's first. So this is ti plus n1 minus m1g j is equal to m1a i. So the i component, well, there's an i component here. That means that the j components are not involved. So the i's must match. They're not related. This is saying to the right, and this is saying up. This is saying to the right, and this is up. The up is zero. So to the right just means that the, the i components must be the same. So the tension in the rope is m1a. So I don't know what T and A are, so that doesn't really help so far. So I got first equation. The second equation says that the J component must be equal to zero J. So I can rearrange that and just write down that N1 minus M1G is equal to zero. And if you look at this, this equation, right, this automatically tells me that N1, the normal force, is just nothing more than M1G. Done but we didn't have to calculate it, but it's just there. So we have an equation, so we'll call this equation number one. Equation number two is not useful because I really want to calculate T's and A's. There's no T's and A's, so this seems to be an independent equation. So I just wrote it over here. So next equation. So take a look at the second uh, free body diagram. There's two equations. We're going to repeat the same process over and over again. And let me just check about here. Yeah, I just want to make sure that everything is on the screen. Okay, so that would mean that a little smaller. <laughs> Sum of all forces equals mass times acceleration of the second object. The two forces are T2 and FG2, looking at this diagram right here. T2 plus force of gravity on the second object is equal to M2A2. Now we start pulling out uh, the components. What direction is T2? It's going up. It's got a magnitude of T, so that will be T I, uh, sorry, J. <laughs> it's up. Plus, what's the force of gravity? It's actually, since I'm running out of space, I just want to write down the answers. So this is M2 G J is equal to M2. What's the direction? Acceleration. Acceleration seems to be going down, so that's A minus G. So there's a minus a g so i'll just put the whole answer is minus m2 a j and rearranging and noticing the components are the same we get another equation that says t minus m2 g is equal to minus m2 a so here's our second equation equation two i'm putting it in because just in case you might not see it on the board so we have two equations equation one and equation two. Two equations, two unknowns. Distinctly different equations, so now we have to just solve. So um, I'm out of space, so I think I'll erase this over here and leave the diagram here. So, so this is only because I have, you know, a limited space for doing, doing work on this board. I can't like go to the next board, like in a classroom. This is terrible, but that's life. T, is equal to m1a and we have the second equation that says t minus m2g is equal to minus m2a so we just have to solve well i already have t so i might as well back substitute this into the second equation into here and so this is m1a minus m2g is equal to minus m2a move this term to this side and factor out so we get m1 plus m2 a move this term to the other side that's equal to m2 g so now we know the acceleration the acceleration is nothing more than m2 over m1 plus m2 
acting on G. Okay, great. Now that uh, we've gotten the acceleration, uh, let me erase this. So we've now back substitute for T, the tension. So I'll put it back into the first equation because it's just readily there. So what's the tension? Tension is equal to m1 times a. And what is m1? Well, I'm sorry, acceleration is just, this is now parentheses, m2 over m1 plus m2 times g is the acceleration to the right. And so this is the tension in the rope. So the tension is equal to m1 m2 over m1 plus m2 g. That's your tension. So we've solved for the acceleration. And in your last step after you've done everything, one way of checking if everything is OK, right, you should double check and uh, make sure the units are correct. Notice this is like kilograms times kilograms divided by kilograms. So this will be in units kilograms, kilograms times meters per second squared, newtons. Makes sense. How about the acceleration? Kilograms over kilograms plus kilograms, kilograms, so the unitless. And that's the same units. Acceleration, they seem to be unitly units. In units, it seems to be correct. In your last step, whatever numbers that somebody gives you, maybe somebody told you that M1 is equal to 10 kilograms and M2 is 20 kilograms, then do the substitution in the last step. So I would say that A is equal to M2, which is 20 kilograms, divisible by M1, which is 10 plus 20 times G, 9.8 meters per second squared is the final answer. So bring out your calculator and find the answer. Here's your tension. Repeat the process again. This is tension is uh, 10 times 20 over 10 plus 20 times 9.8 newtons. So bring out your calculator and double check. So this is the basic procedure. You shouldn't kill yourself in uh, thinking that uh, it's a mechanical set of steps, but you have to do it consistently. Hopefully, uh, you've now understood the process of step number one, diagram. Step number two, do a free body diagram, diagrams. Step number three, sigma f is equal to mass times acceleration. Step number four, solve equations. So here are your basic four steps you should be doing repeating over and over again. It's a mechanical set of procedure, but uh, it's systematic.